Every source has a source. The Athletic. Beitar Jerusalem, Israel's most popular club, has announced a new investor. Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa Al Nayen, a distant member of the United Arab Emirates royal family, is the club's new co-owner. Now, on the face of it, that's nothing unusual. Gulf investors from the UAE, Qatar, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia have been buying up football clubs across the world, big and small, for over a decade now. But this purchase was different because of Beitar Jerusalem's special place in Israeli football. An Arab has never played for the club, despite making up more than 20% of Israel's population. Beitar Jerusalem emerged from the 1920s revisionist Zionist movement founded by Zeev Yabotinsky, promoting a more muscular right-wing Zionism. The club draws its support traditionally from the political right, especially Israel's Mizrahi community, with its roots in the Middle East. The club also had strong ties to the Likud party and can count current Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu among its supporters. But the opposition to fielding Arab and Muslim players has largely been driven by La Familia, Beitar's far-right and extremely violent ultra-group. The club has been fined repeatedly for anti-Muslim chanting as well as rioting and violence. Any time an Arab player has been close to signing, like the Israeli international Abbas Suan in 2005, protests followed and the signing was scuppered. When Ali Mohammed, a midfielder from Niger, signed in 2019, La Familia protested, demanding that he change his name, despite him being a Christian. Mohammed was also racially abused during an open training session, and in response, owner Moshe Khageg, a tech entrepreneur, threatened to sue the offending supporters. They love the club and what it represents, but they're racist and that's a big problem, he told CNN. Now, when the news of Beitar's Arab investment first made the Israeli press following the historic signing of the Abraham Accords and the normalization of relations between Israel and the UAE, La Familia daubed explicit graffiti opposing the move outside their Teddy Stadium. But Sheikh Khaled isn't the first investor to come to the club in the hope of changing Beitar's reputation. Over the past 15 years, a carousel of owners have tried and failed, lured by both access to the political elite that the club provides and the promise of awakening a sleeping giant. More often than not, their hopes are destroyed along the way. It was the Russian-born, French-Israeli oligarch Arkady Gaidamak, who took over the club in 2005, who promised that he would sign Abbas Suan and change the perception of Beitar. He invested and the club won back-to-back -back titles and state cups, but La Familia revolted against any attempts at allowing a Muslim or an Arab to play for the club. After one nasty pitch invasion, Gaidamak told Israel's army radio, the idiot bastards can leave. The fans who went wild yesterday are bastards and I have no respect for them. There was, though, a bigger game afoot. Gaidamak, whose son Sasha owned Portsmouth FC during their most successful recent period, admitted that he was more interested in political power than he was in footballing success. Arkady Gaidamek set up his own political party and used the club as a platform to try and get elected as the mayor of Jerusalem. I was never a football fan, I always said that, he revealed in Forever Pure, a documentary about the club. But Baitar had more fans than all of the other clubs in Israel combined, and this is why it's a very interesting propaganda tool. It has a huge influence on Israeli society. However, silverware didn't lead to success at the ballot box. In Jerusalem's 2008 mayoral election, he finished a dismal third with less than 4% of the vote. The financial crisis hit him and his son hard too. Sasha sold Portsmouth shortly before a financial collapse that saw Portsmouth become the first Premier League club to go into administration. Enter Guma Aguia, a young Brazilian-born US-raised natural gas tycoon eager to invest in Israel. He initially agreed to invest $4 million in Beitar to stave off bankruptcy as well as the city's basketball team, with the hope of later buying the club off Gaidamak outright. But first, he wanted to deal with the racism. The one thing I would like to see is more tolerance from the fans, he told World Soccer magazine. I certainly wouldn't want to go to Barcelona and hear them singing Death to the Jews. But Aguiar had long struggled with drug and alcohol addiction and was in a messy court battle with his uncle and former business partner over his fortune. A year later, Aguiar was committed to the Abba Benel Mental Health Center outside Jerusalem. 
A few days earlier, he'd given an interview with a local newspaper claiming he was in mobile phone contact with Gilad Shalit, the Israeli soldier kidnapped by Hamas militants and held incommunicado in the Gaza Strip since 2006. Aguiar had claimed he'd sneaked into the Gaza Strip and freed Shalit, who was now holed up in one of his properties. Of course, none of it was true. Shalit was eventually released in a Palestinian prisoner swap deal in 2011. But by then, Aguiar was out of hospital, with multiple court cases closing in. In 2012, his motorboat, the TT Zion, was found on Fort Lauderdale Beach on the Florida coast with his phone and wallet inside, but he nowhere to be found. At first, it seemed like a tragic accident, but a legal battle broke out between the family over what was left of Aguiar's assets. Lawyers for Aguiar's wife suggested that Guma might not be dead after all and could in fact be living under a new identity in Amsterdam. But neither he nor his body have ever been found. He was declared legally dead in January 2015. So, Gaidamak was back in charge, but eager to sell, prompting another attempt to break the Muslim player embargo and improve the club's image. In early 2013, Beitar announced the signing of two Chechen Muslim players, Zawa Sadiev and Zabrail Kadiev. Their signing was met with a furious response from the fans, with La Familia barracking the players and management as traitors during training sessions and Beitar's offices being set on fire with a Molotov cocktail. When Sadiev scored his first and only goal for Beitar, hundreds turned their backs and walked out of the Teddy Stadium rather than celebrate the goal. Between them, they played just eight games for the club. And the incident marked the end of Arcady's time at Beitar. He sold the club a few months later, but his legal troubles were about to take a turn for the worst. Gaidemak had been found guilty in a long-running French court case of illegal gun-running during the Angolan Civil War, known in France as Angolagate. He was later acquitted, but then sentenced to three years in prison for tax evasion related to the Angolagate affair. Later, he was released with an electronic tag after just a year inside. The club was sold to businessman Eli Tabib, whose attempts to tame La Familia didn't go well either, largely thanks to his previous ownership of Hapoel Tel Aviv, a club with a traditionally more left-wing fan base. The group would frequently protest in his neighborhood, and in 2015, he was shot outside his Tel Aviv home. It's all about the soccer, said Tabib. True, it was an attempted assassination. Soccer is bankrupt. I need to sit down and think hard about whether to stay in the world of soccer and whether to remain in Israel at all or to return to the United States. But he stayed on, and in 2018, he vowed to rename the club Beitar Trump Jerusalem in honor of the US president. In the same year, he sold the club to Hogeg, who finalized the deal that sold just under 50% of the club to Sheikh Khalid. The new investment, which is promised to run to $90 million over the next decade, will be focused on infrastructure, youth facilities, and signing new players, the club announced on completion, and represents a new and exciting light, according to Hogeg. Racism is a desecration of God's name, he wrote on Instagram in early December and in response to criticism. We will do what is good for the club, not for the media and the racists. Under Hogeg, the number of racist incidents at Beitar have fallen, Although that's not surprising, given that he recently told the BBC that if a Beitar fan shouted a single racist comment, he would sue you for a million dollars. Still, even after everything that has happened over the last 15 years, the announcement that an Arab investor has arrived at Beitar still came as a huge surprise. The next few months will prove whether the power of La Familia has finally been broken or not. But we don't need another striker. Listen, he's going to sign. My nephew's girlfriend's brother's barber, his best friend to the Kidman assistant. Every source has a source. The Athletic.